Hi. Uh, Neha, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I hope everybody is done with their coffee and they'll not feel sleepy throughout the session. <laughs> So very happy to be joined by uh, Josie and David. Josie Joseph is a veteran journalist. Lots of journalists have looked up to, their, to his work, to the kind of investigative stories that he has done. He's looked into national security. He's looked into land scams. He's looked into Commonwealth uh, scams. So thank you, Josie, for being here. And uh, we also have a very special guest, David, because when Oscar-nominated uh, filmmaker Amy Berg was looking to uh, investigate the case of Adnan Syed, she wanted to hire an investigator to look, get into the bottom of the case. And she hired QRI, a private agency. And David is one of the senior, uh, senior investi uh, investigators with the company. He's been a journalist for many years. He was one of the founding members of The Independent. So welcome, David. Um, I think we should play the trailer of David's uh, role in the, doc the, of the documentary in which David had a significant role to play. You're only on one side, and that side is getting to the truth. The day she went missing was just a normal day to me. It never hit me that something could be wrong until they found her body. The suspect is Adnan Musad Syed. 그 아이를 죄를 주는 것밖에 는 바라는 게 없습니다. It felt like they got to have the wrong guy. If he did what he did, then who's the person that I saw every day in class? For years, I've been saying to Adnan, we should go to media, we should go to journalists, because they can do things we can't do. But nobody realized it's going to turn into anything big. Adnan Syed's story has captivated millions since the launch of the podcast Serial. Serial is what brought new evidence to the case. But Serial was not going to exonerate him. Now, 18 years after he was sent to prison, convicted murderer Adnan Syed heads back to court as questions about his case continue to surface. As investigators, we go beyond what law enforcement has already done. Failure to investigate more thoroughly is a major mistake. I never thought about him over all these years. This was a person that had a life. This is an interesting case, but it's people's lives. I know there are things that don't look good for me. I'm telling you, that's what happened. How could anybody think that he's being straight about this? That doesn't make him a killer. Makes him an unusual person. This is perhaps the critical piece to this case. They were going to follow that wherever it took them. This is a piece of evidence that nobody even realized existed. I want you to look into my eyes and tell me of your innocence. Great. So uh, I would start with uh, Josie wrote an article six months or in December last year saying uh, investigative journalism is dead. And I think I will start with that note because you're talking about investigative journalism. David, you've been a journalist for, you, you were in, uh, attached to different media houses for more than 30 years and then you moved to this agency to investigate cases. So uh, first of all, I would say why did you decide to do this? And secondly, how was it different from the investigative journalism that was conventionally practiced in media houses that you had come across? Well, it's, it's been a very interesting journey. As I, I, you're right, I was with The Independent for 30 years. I then spent two years freelancing, uh, mostly writing for Esquire magazine, doing investigative work for them and profiles. Uh, and then I really just got this opportunity when this company came to me. That it's, a, it's a small, private investigating firm. And I thought, well, this is rather exciting. I'm, I'm going to be Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> um, and it's interesting now that I am a private detective, when I tell people I'm a private detective, they go, oh, that's so exciting. Tell, you know, what do you actually do? And they think, I think their first reaction is that I hide behind rhododendron bushes and, and spy on people's mistresses. And that, but that's not actually uh, what we do. And to my great uh, surprise, although I had an inkling about this before I took the job, um, I'm almost doing more of what I was doing as a journalist now as a private investigator. Uh, partly because we're doing work with media companies. You saw the HBO trailer 
for the Adnan Syed case, and you saw my two colleagues, Luke and Tyler, who are the two investigators in that. And if any of you saw the free Meek Amazon uh, preview this morning, that starts, I think, on Friday about Meek Mill, the rapper in, uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia, that we actually, our investigation got his conviction overturned. It was overturned by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania eight days ago. And we spent six months really working you know, 18 hour days investigating why that young black man had been put in prison and if it was, uh, if he should be there. And we, it, we, you know, we found the evidence that got his conviction overturned. Um, so that's kind of been quite an inspiring experience for me. Uh, and also we're doing other cases where we're not overtly working with uh, media companies, but where our contacts, and our, um, four of my colleagues are former journalists too, I should say. So we have a lot of friends in the media business. And often when we're doing important cases, I've been working on a torture case recently, uh, working on a very important Me Too case. Part of the end game is to have, is to go to media outlets, uh, go to Josie and say, Look, we've done some work here. It's not going to be enough to satisfy you as a journalist, but if you're interested in this story, why don't you run with it? So it's not like we're planting stories anywhere, but we're, we are engaging with journalists. And, and so in that sense, I suddenly realize that I, I am still very involved in, in, in the journalism. And the last thing I'd just say is that, I'm sure we'll talk about this some more, but we get hired by people with money. And that was certainly the case in Free Meek, where our client was Jay-Z and Rock Nation. Jay-Z has a bit of money, as you may know. So, uh, in a sense, we are journalists for hire as private investigators, and we can bring money to the game and money to the table. Uh, and so it's been, uh, I've only been doing this for 18 months, but it's an exciting experience. Well, that's interesting, and we'll come to why uh, did you choose this and the question of resources that you brought up in, uh, while addressing this question. Josie, in your piece, uh, and I am particularly referring to this piece because it's really important at this time and space in Indian media. You say that there's a, you have that MOG folder in your inbox which has all these stories from the last one decade which were killed or not published for some reason. Do you want to talk about those stories and the reasons why they were not, never put out in the public domain? See, I think uh, the very model of Indian mainstream media which is advertisement driven is the big culprit and uh, uh, when I started, when I opened the more folder and started storing stories in them, most of them are stories about uh, powerful corporates. But sad to say that in the last uh, three, four years, the stories that I've been piling up are not just about corporate corruption, they're also about political uh, establishment, of especially the government of the day. So I think without exception, at least in places that I worked in last job of my nose with the Hindu, I, I don't think there is any media organization which is willing to address the real challenges. And, and that is why my little more came up. Uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why I decided to come out of mainstream media and try and do something with my skills. Uh, I, think, I think we are in for the long crisis because the, with, the, with the falling moral standards of political establishment, our mainstream media is going to fall with it too, not stand up to it. So in the US when we saw Trump rising, uh, the mainstream media actually became a bulwark against that and they became more influential. Uh, so, so it's a case in the UK and I'm sure we are entering a very interesting phase in UK with Boris Johnson and versus the media. Uh, even in Pakistan, uh, we have seen the media playing the adversarial role better than us. But our media unfortunately is nothing, mainstream media is nothing more than a propagandist arm for the government of the day. So as the government becomes bullier and bullier, the media will fall at its feet and crawl, do whatever they want. And that's what we are witnessing. So like when you say uh, that the stories have been from the last decade, so is there a difference between, was there, uh, because this is an important question that needs to be addressed. Like for instance, I, in my uh, journalism career, there were points when I got legal notices earlier in the previous uh, government's regime as well. But now, the, the difference is that apart from the legal cases, there are legal notices, there are criminal cases, there is a lot of uh, online trolling, offline harassment that happens, which is, so uh, the kind of stories that you have, uh, which were not put out in the public domain, what is the difference between 
the previous government and this government did? Previous government was a retail bully and this is a wholesale bully. <laughs> That's <what I'm> <laughs> No, but uh, uh, to be factually honest, uh, this government has, uh, I don't think uh, we have seen any level of media censorship and fear uh, after the emergency that we are witnessing now. And, and, and to that, if, if the political ruling regime of the day is also partially the custodian of our democratic values, then the blame is at the doorsteps of Narendra Modi, which he has to bear. But at the same time, I think we also have a deeply moral uh, media barons in this country whose, uh, whose pursuits are nothing beyond profit and uh, influence. So I think it's a very sad situation. It's quite embarrassing situation for a democracy like ours. Right. Uh, David, uh, you also earlier, I, I, like I told you before the panel, that you had, you had written a piece about how Obama administration came down cracking on some of the journalists covering the White House and not and the pressure on them to reveal their sources and stuff. I would like to ask you what is the difference between the previous government again in the US and now with Trump coming in? Has the situation changed? Is there pressure on people reporting government departments? How is it there? Just give us a sense of how is it going and uh, uh, is there a scope for doing investigative stories when it comes to this kind of uh, censorship and this kind of control? Um, Obama was a retail bully. <laughs> 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 Interestingly, Obama was very, uh, you would think as he was a progressive president in many ways, obviously, um, but he was quite, uh, he did come down hard, uh, or tried to come down hard on journalists who had been leaked uh, information by government whistleblowers and uh, threatened them uh, with jail. You know, it, 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 this kind of thing has a chilling effect on journalists everywhere. I, the last thing I did as a journalist was write a piece about uh, sexual harassment at NBC News, particularly about a figure called Matt Lauer, who used to be a very well-known morning TV personality. And uh, in the course of, of, of reporting it, I, I, I uncovered uh, some interesting information about NBC News and its treatment of Harvey Weinstein. And I was pretty sure of my sourcing, uh, but NBC News, I'm sorry, the, the, the magazine, well, NBC News became so threatening to me, more or less smearing me in public uh, and threatening uh, Esquire, who was publishing the piece, and at one point we were close to printing, and my editor at Esquire ran me up and said, David, are you sure about this? And I'm, uh, yes, of course I'm sure about this. He said, well, but are you willing to go to prison for it? And I'm like, hell no. <laughs> Take it out. Which that's a shame. As a journalist, I should be ashamed of myself. But um, uh, so in fact, the point remained in the piece, but in a way that was a bit more obscure. But uh, this president uh, he, he is wholesale in the sense that, you know, I, I've stood at uh, rallies with, with Donald Trump. I've been in the press pen at, at his rallies in 2016 when I was still writing political journalism. And, you know, he would literally talk as if I, you know, imagine I'm Donald Trump and I say to you all now, please all turn around and look at the journalists standing at the back. And you would all turn around and you'd all boo and hiss at us standing in the press pen. That was kind of chilling. Um, but I think it sounds to me as if in India uh, you have a much more serious systemic problem. And I mean, I have to say that in the US and certainly in Britain, uh, I think the press freedom remains more robust. See, I, I just want to add one more thing. You know, there is this uh, hidden hand of our sponsors like Facebook and Google and Twitter, while it may be technologies that have enabled connecting the world, there are also technologies that have enabled uh, fear-mongering hatred at a very large wholesale scale for leaders across the world. And, and, and in India, I think there is enough academic scientific evidence to show that that kind of xenophobia online has been very systematically built up by a certain kind of politics Everyone else has only copied them or trying to copy them. So it's a very clearly documented case, but unfortunate, there are no courts for them. And, and this greed of this generation to, to somehow make villainies out of ourselves is, is also resulting in catastrophe in our country sites on WhatsApp and Facebook and people are getting killed. But I don't think Mike uh, Zuckerberg or anybody else is really consciously bothered about what the immorality they're showering over the poor parts of the world. 
that's really uh, also important because David, we will not, we also do not have that problem because our prime minister does not conduct press conferences. He does not, so <laughs> so we don't have that problem in that manner. But yes, definitely uh, the protection of sources and then uh, uh, like one of our. Uh, top ministers coined the word prostitute, which is now we are all so immune to, like it's been used against us so many times and we're like, okay, just think of a new one now. But uh, as far as protection of sources, and Josie, the point you also make, that uh, what happens to the whistleblowers now? What happens to the scope, like government departments not talking to people recently, the Nirmala Sitaraman, our finance minister again, told people to send emails instead of coming and asking questions. So with these kind of things, how do we access sources in, if, if one is really uh, determined to, to dig, in, dig deeper into things and do an investigative project? What is the scope of it now in today's times? No, it has become extremely difficult, especially for the beat reporters. The reporters were supposed to cover beat. You know, we are a large country, so, and we have got a very, we always had a very robust uh, mechanism of beat reporting. So, the finance ministry has a beat. In fact, I don't think in UK and I see that, but in India, the beat reporting is very deep. But one of the key factors of beat reporting, I did defense and intelligence for uh, maybe 15 years. One of the key parts of it is that you have certain amount of uh, unfettered access into the corridors of power. So you are able to knock and walk into a secretary's office of, or a general's office, the minister's office. And, and in a way, it was also a great way of opening, of throwing light into certain corners of governance. But Modi government has very firmly shut out those access. So I think beat reporting in India is really suffering because of which the complex government and what's happening in is not clear. I don't, I, I, was, I was with somebody this morning uh, uh, at the Aero City. There are all kinds of rumors doing the rounds about the steps that government is going to take for the financial world because Indian economy is really tanking up and there are all kinds of bizarre rumors coming out of Kashmir. So there is a set of decisions being made and at the end result is that there is panic and there are human lives being lost. So I think this government has really undone uh, the wave of transparency that was sweeping through India starting 2005 when we introduced the Right to Information Act and which is quite revolutionary, which is basically allowing Indian citizens access to any government file except those dealing with national security. They've shut it down, they're virtually shutting down, they're pulling down the iron curtains of obscurity over various government departments. So I think we are headed into a very really dark ages as far as journalism is done. But we should still hope that there are good people out there who will risk their careers and jobs because we can't stop doing journalism. You know, we don't have rich people engaging us for private investigations. So we still have to keep doing journalism and hope that one day situation will change or maybe the disaster of the economy or other public interests will force the government to change. Because if this system of governance continues, I think we are headed towards real, real situation where the very idea of India may be really threatened. No, absolutely. And also while we're talking about the, the political atmosphere, there is a great corporate political nexus within our mainstream media, and which is the reason why there are, uh, a, there are attacks on press freedom and then there is no money. And while there are these shortcuts being made to transition into the digital space, everything, the entire model is to like sit on the desk and, lo and one has come across so many uh, journalists who are new to the profession and they are uh, confined to the desk min rehashing PTI and Wire and Reuters copies and putting them out or there is a great stress on data journalism which is great but then data journalism is just uh, being reduced to mining numbers and not going to the ground and actually getting enough voices from the ground to back that data. That is not happening any longer. So then David, what do you think is a perfect, I mean it's a, it's a Strange question, but what do you think is the perfect revenue model or if there's any interest at all to, to invest in investigative journalism? Um, but first of all, I'm very depressed to hear what you're saying about the state of affairs in India. That's, that I, had, I, I didn't know that it had got to that state. And although we have a very vociferous president uh, barking away at how horrible the press is, and he's now hating Fox News, which is kind of strange. Um, but he, you know, his bark is worse than his bite, and we still, uh, we still have some amazing reporting going on in the U.S. that uh, drives him crazy, which is part of the reason we all like to be journalists. I think <laughs> uh, is to drive people in power crazy. You were mentioned sort of data mining and working at the at the sort of. Uh, 
coal face of the computer screen. I think one thing I've come to appreciate more at my new job at the private investigating firm is you have to strike a balance. I was actually really bad at that part of the job. I was brought up as the kind of beat journalist you were describing, where I relied almost entirely on the relationships that I built with people in the ministries, or I started off as a journalist in Brussels, and I kind of wormed my way into the European Commission, and that's how I worked, and it's really how I continued to work for the, ne for the next 30 years. And when I got to the investigating firm, I understood that actually there is so much a value, you know, actually just being at the computer screen and knowing what on earth you're doing. You know, I, I, I had no idea how to, I, to track down people's phone numbers, their driving license records. All these things are very, very important. But it's not enough. You also have to go out in the field and, and talk to people. And one of the luxuries now that I uh, say now I'm a journalist for hire kind of thing at the, at the, at the detective agency, I love saying detective agency, um, is that we, you know, we can spend six months doing something like getting Meek Mill out of prison. And, and my hope is that uh, actually the collaboration between my industry as private investigating and journalism can grow and that there will be money for it. I mean, in the, it always helps if, there's an, if there is a financial interest in the person who's providing the money. And in the case of Jay-Z, he wanted to elevate Meek Mill into a kind of saint-like figure, which he has done. But at the same time, the issue that he's highlighted of social injustice for African Americans is super important. So, I, 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 you know, we shouldn't get too gloomy here. And I, I do think, one, one, hopefully, you know, I think the, the money of philanthropists, the money of uh, the uh, not-for-profit institutions that philanthropists help support, uh, these are the kind of areas where we're finding funding and we can do some really super investigative work with the support of, of those institutions and those philanthropists and, and business people. That's uh, also very interesting because, Josie, uh, there's also a generation of journalists who spend their time, all their time, and that's how it is now, the pattern, that spend their time scouring tweets of uh, politicians, uh, official statements, and they, they don't know, I mean, not that they don't want to know, but they don't get the chance to go out and know how the government functions. Yes, they yeah, they're not know. allowed to, but yeah. their editors are so under pressure to get the clicks, yeah. and they don't like to see people go out the door. It, it, it's, it's insane. But yeah, I yeah. think it's not that they don't want to, yeah. but they're not allowed to. Yeah. So like, they wouldn't know if you have to, if, if you are covering crime, or there's a crime story, what is the first step? Uh, that is taken when you go to the police station, what happens. So in such a scenario, do you think there's even any intent to, uh, to get people to go out and do any ground reporting? Because I, I've seen in newsrooms, especially in the digital newsrooms now, the target is to put out like uh, at least 250 stories per day, out of which 150 or 175 are rehashed copies of the wire copies, and then there are each new person has to write three to four opinion pieces a day. How do you write three to four opinion pieces a day? Then like, that's again a question. So do you think there's any intent at all in this model? Because especially the digital space is being used now. The entire TRP model has come in, where everything is being done for clickbaits. And that is being used to generate revenues. So do you think there is, they, they want to change it? See, I, I, I don't think the mainstream media wants to change it. And unfortunately, in this country, Many of, I mean, uh, Mukesh Ampani owns some of the largest media houses. He's a richest Indian petrochemical giant. Uh, in fact, I've been getting phone calls and resumes from people who work for him because apparently he doesn't have money to pay journalists. So it's, 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 a, it's a banana republic that the richest man whose profits are soaring doesn't have money to pay his journalists and they're looking for jobs. Uh, it is because that he has told his CEO, look, get your money from the click and bait and the sponsored content and the paid news. Uh, I'm not going to put in money for you. Uh, mainstream media is a victim of that, the advertisement-driven business model. And the other part is that uh, mainstream media of India in the last 20, 30 years has not really uh, experienced the power, branding power, and the financial potential of great content, unlike the West. Yeah. So we have in the 30 years, like ever since Samir Jain started producing the cover price for Times of India, uh, you, you know, you can buy a newspaper in this country at half the price of a cup of uh, coffee on the uh, tea stall outside. N not even in a good coffee shop, but I'm, I'm talking about the real street side tea shop. Right. Not right. Starbucks. 
Davos, yes, Davos, yeah. No, so, not Starbucks. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, but, but if you go to uh, US or UK, you, you want to buy a newspaper, you have to pay at least two, three uh, dollars for it, right? Absolutely. So we, yeah. have, we have completely inverse model. So I don't think the present mainstream media will invest money in any serious journalism. Also because of what you said, which is that we are witnessing that firm move away from uh, legacy media into the new digital space. And many of these organizations are, have already started struggling with the revenue. They're seeing steep drop in print advertisements. Uh, there is also significant drop in television advertisement. The only good thing in this country is that government is the largest advertiser and it is dispersing ads to their favorites. So these people will make more efforts to bend backwards to please the government. So it's a very strange phenomenon and time that we have entered. I don't think these media houses will bring in any change. It might be from outside, maybe philanthropies, maybe the kind of IPSM of kind of foundations, maybe some of us who are trying to create new models. Are, are you seeing that uh, fewer young uh, aspiring journalists are joining the profession because they're discouraged or do you see an exodus of quality journalists? I certainly see it in the US. Um, I mean, I left partly because I was fed up with uh, what was happening to the industry. But are you worried that the, the, you know, it sounds to me in the environment you're describing, it's quite, it would be quite difficult to attract people, you know, the kind of work that is going on is not what journalists think they should be doing. Yeah, I mean, see, there are two things happening. At the senior level, many are leaving mainstream media because they're uh, either, they don't have, they can't find jobs or they don't find it encouraging and, uh, you know. Uh, at the junior level, one of the great things that have happened in India is in the last 10, 15 years, we have had a large number of youngsters who are going to global universities to the best of journalism institutes. They're all coming back here. So we have a great talent pool in the younger lot. That's what I think. Also, really bright uh, youngsters have come in from, uh, you know, smaller towns, villages, people like, uh, you know, they handle up in the career. Most of them are sitting frustrated. They are angry. They don't know where to go, what to do. So that's one of the common refrains. So many of them might actually slowly leave journalism and move away because there are no opportunities here to do good journalism. So this one, one thing I want to quickly address because the five minutes left. Uh, what in in this such a scenario? What because every day since 23rd May. On an average, every week there's a case against journalists in India. And there are cases filed against people, and not just the usual uh, defamation cases, but also seal serious law and order cases that have been filed against people. So in such a scenario, what role are, uh, firstly, what kind of censorship has set in, and what role are press bodies playing. So Josie, if you could quickly talk about your case and what role, is there any solidarity at all? And then David, we'll come to you to find out if something's going on there in your area of work. You're talking about the Jet Airways case, right? Yes. So after my book was published by Harper Collins, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, uh, I was slapped with uh, two cases uh, of, of 1,000 crore rupees each in Bombay High Court. And from the very moment of the case begins the 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 immorality of Indian democracy because Bombay High Court, if by depositing 3 lakh rupees, you can file any amount of defamation. Uh, whereas if you want to file the case in Delhi, you will have to deposit about 10 percentage of the money that you demand because... Uh, uh, so, so somebody files a case there and Jet Airways has fields the most expensive lawyers including Harish Salve in the case. And uh, strangely, Harper Collins, which has a global liability because of my case, which has bigger reasons to be concerned, they stand by me. But Outlook magazine, which had published an extract of my chapter and was one of the parties, without telling me, they quietly went and filed in the court that they are willing to publish any statement Jet gives and they ran away without telling me. I had to force them to share a statement with them. And, and that editor who did it is now editing Tribune or one of the papers. And I think the same editor did something nasty things yeah. to your case in Assam. Yeah. He withdrew his legal support for you? Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it's strange. So, I don't think. So, I, I, when I was in Times of India, uh, regularly defamation notice would land up. The legal team there is more afraid than the journalists. They are, they are more bothered about protecting their owners and other things. Yeah. So, there is no. So, I would. No, it, it used to be on me to reassure the legal director listen, relax. Nothing, you know, nothing is wrong. We are in control. So, it's a very bizarre situation. So, we don't have institutional support. I didn't receive any call or any support from any institutions in this country. Yeah. I had friends reaching out saying that can we financially help you. I said no, thank you. Uh, I've had some good lawyers like Prashant Bhushan who called up saying that look come we will draft the uh, response. 
uh, and Mihir Deshai fight in the case in Bombay. But I didn't receive any support. And I'm, see, I can afford to fight, yes. but I, I, I feel bad for those chaps in official towns yes. and other places who are facing the, the mafias and the, the bullies around, you know? Yeah, in my case also, like, because you're talking about outlook, I have two cases against me, and this is for a story I'd done in 2016. So one is the defamation, but it's criminal defamation. And the second is inciting communal hatred. So both of them are filed by RSS, which is almost like irony that I'm inciting communal hatred and not them. But uh, Outlook, uh, Outlook is not supporting me. And again, uh, unfortunately, the initially I, the lawyer, again, I do not have any support from anyone. And because I also work independently, which means no institution backing me. And also, in case of press bodies, nobody initially came out with any support statement until and unless uh, till the point CPJ actually acknowledged and said something's happening. So that also tells us about the role of press bodies right now in India. But uh, you're talking about the same reporters. The, there are, there's a reporter called Santosh Yadav in Chhattisgarh. He was imprisoned for almost a year and when he was, uh, came out on bail since then, for the last two years, he has to go to the local police station twice a week to register his attendance. So that is the kind of torture that is happening and that is the kind of harassment that people yeah. are facing. David, would, would you like I, to quickly... I, I just want to add one line to it. See, it's 70 years since independence, we do not even, I mean, our courts have not even codified what are the privileges of a journalist. So I don't know what privileges I have. I just, I, I filed a set of... Uh, documents which are supposed to be official secrets in court. Now, government and this government especially could turn around and say, look, this is national secrets, you are colliding with the enemy. Right? Any, anything is possible. This is complete banana republic at, out, at play. Well, I, I'm feeling luckier and luckier as we, <laughs> as we <laughs> continue with this panel. And I'm even luckier in this sense, which is curiously working with a private investigating firm. We as almost always try to work through, not to the client directly, but with their lawyers. And that gives us lawyer-client privilege. So even though we're not the lawyer, if, we, if we're hired by the lawyer, we have client-lawyer uh, privilege, and therefore nobody can depose us, nobody can force us to reveal anything about our investigations and what we find. That's a, a luxury which journalists don't have, although, of course, in the United States, uh, the, um, I mean, I come from the UK tradition where the libel laws are pretty restrictive. In the US, they're much looser. It's quite hard to get sued for libel in America. It does happen. We were in a, I was in a very interesting session earlier talking about Sheldon Adelson in Las Vegas who bought the Las Vegas uh, Journal Review because he wanted to stop it publishing nasty things about him. And he also sued one of its journalists who'd said nasty things about him and drove him into bankruptcy. Um, no one's losing their lives, but occasionally lose their, their livelihoods. But um, nothing on the scale that you've been talking about, I'm happy to say, um, so far anyway. On that note, I think, uh, I hope more private investigative agencies also come up in India and we get some chance to earn some living and also do some work. And also, uh, in, 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 because we're talking about democracy when all our institutions have been weakened in the last few years, I hope that there'll be more resources, at least more conversation around investigative journalism. We have 10 minutes for Q&A and I was hoping to take four questions maximum and maybe two at a time so that we can make best use of whatever we have. Yeah, one and two. So this morning there was uh, another panel which was sponsoring the news and at that panel I asked the question, uh, you know what, if, if uh, the establishment uh, puts pressure on news agencies to drop news or to, to you know, uh, or threaten them, you know, with uh, withdrawing their advertisements because the, the particular publication chooses to or write some particular news about them. And this could be not only the government establishments but also the public establishments. Like that. I'm a business journalist, slight uh, background on this. So uh, I, I was covering a certain uh, financial scam, and it was uh, going through for years, and certain, uh, finally the person was committed and charged it. Then, uh, like we thought it was over, then uh, suddenly a book came out, which uh, 
said it was an investigative account of the entire scam. And it was basically the defense case, which uh, now masqueraded as an investigative uh, fraud. So in this, co like, uh, in this context, I just want to ask David, what safeguards is he taking to ensure that, because if you say poor is rich can come to you and get the investigation done, what is the safeguard you are, or what is the public interest principle you follow in taking up these cases? Because the trailer and the free week uh, document which I saw, essentially is uh, trying to take the side of the defense case and try to upturn whatever has uh, conviction uh, wrong and uh, prove, the, prove it that way. So uh, there's some kind of a gray area here. You could you know, um, thank you for both the questions. Um, to answer the second question first, uh, since it was addressed to me and maybe um, Josie, um, we have endless debates in our office uh, about which cases we take on and which we don't. And we turn down, we say no to a surprising number of cases, including some that would earn us a great deal of money because it doesn't, sm doesn't pass the smell test as far as we are concerned. So it is quite subjective, and we are an office of nine like-minded, progressive, I hope, uh, decent human beings uh, who uh, we're very picky about uh, who we work for and who we don't. We, we, in the last month alone, we had a, uh, what would have been a very high-value case uh, involving an extremely well-known uh, Hollywood personality. Uh, but what was required of us uh, just didn't sit well with us, not even just politically, but ethically. Uh, and, uh, and we get asked sometimes uh, a big public relations firm, global public relations firm, asked us to, uh, to do a case recently which uh, would have put us uh, essentially in a position of fighting a union, didn't sit well with us. So, but it is subjective, and you know, in the case of Meek Mill, we're perfectly well aware that the real motivation of Jay-Z, the investigation that we were doing was already three quarters of the way done when Jay-Z suddenly thinks to himself, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to bring in Amazon to make a documentary series, which is gonna be a big event, by the way. It's already, you know, a lot of people will watch it. And of course, we know that he does that because he's elevating Meek Mill into a mega superstar. But to us, it also is at an amazingly opportune moment where the whole country is talking about social justice, uh, the movie recently on Netflix about uh, the, the uh, Central Park Five. So, you know, you balance, you say, well, on the one hand, this is a bit, mm, we know what they're really doing, but on the other hand, this could actually... So I, I don't want to be self-righteous about this, but we, we try to... Sorry, yeah? You're being your own judge then, like... Yeah. Do you put it out, like, what is the process? But at, the, at the end of the day, we have to uh, make money. Uh, so I dare say that, you know, there, will be, there are some... Uh, cases that we've taken that maybe we've not exactly regretted, but we have the luxury, yes, or exactly, we are, we are the arbiters. And, you know, and, and just like journalism, there are, there are good actors and bad actors, and certainly that's the case in, in private investigating. I mean, you've seen many cases where the two things actually intersect, like the closing down of the uh, news of the world in London and the voice hacking case, it was, it, it was the newspaper was hiring the investigators and it was the investigators who went to prison. Or the Jeffrey Epstein case at the moment uh, in the US, the guy who's been rearrested for abuse of young girls. He hired, when he, was first, uh, when he was first accused in Florida 10 years ago, he hired a team of private investigators and what did he have them do? He had them investigate the women who were accusing him and smear them. Now, is that a case we would have taken? Not in a million years. Was he asking about the, uh, the growing corporate and government acts? Yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 a standard practice, right? So if you are afraid of all that, don't read newspapers. You should sell sham shampoos, you know, uh, because shampoos and soaps get used again and again. Uh, no, I, I I think this entire conversation that we are building up against uh, 
government or corporates withdrawing advertisement, etc., stems from the fact that we have built a media model which is completely flawed. So if you are honest about your journalism and wanting to be a proper media, then change your model. Like Hindu was trying to do, I don't think it's trying anymore, it was trying to increase the cover price. But then if you increase the cover price, you should increase the quality of your journalism, right? So you can do it. I mean, there are enough models out there in the West which is doing good quality journalism without being dependent upon the advertisers. In this country, especially, the government is the largest advertiser. So. No, I also, uh, when talking about quality of journalism, a lot of local journalists in the smaller towns are actually not paid a salary by these organizations and they are told that you're supposed to bring in ads for the news organization and the commission that you earn by bringing those ads is going to be part of your salary. So it's then not, immediately not it's compromised. Not only in local towns, even in cities like Delhi, many of the editor's job is to get advertisements. Absolutely. I, I would just, uh, can I just add one more thing? I, I, I've been painting this pretty picture about journalism in the US. Believe me, it's not all pretty. And, and, and uh, you mentioned, I think, local outlets in cities and states, not the big New York Times, Washington Post, the decimation of that level in, of journalism. And you know why? It's all profit. Uh, huge numbers of newspapers are now owned by hedge funds, and they have a very clear model. They cut the staff by 40% to save money, and then they wait the two-year lag before the readers begin to notice that the, what they're getting is not what it used to be in journalistic terms. And when they see that the reading public s understand that the paper is a little bit shittier than it used to be, they cut another 40% of the staff and they say, well, let's wait another two years before the public no notices this time. And each time they do that, they up their profits. And I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, this is, this is how it works. And we are witnessing the slaughtering of journalism, television, especially newspapers, around the United States if you take away, you know, the success stories right now of the New York Times, and the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. And it is incredibly depressing. Do we have time for two more questions? One more question, one more question. One. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Vijayta, and last year um, I had worked on a story about the defamation, 28 defamation cases filed by Anil Ambani against uh, jo independent journalists, uh, news organizations, and politicians. Uh, some of my observations were that uh, he very smartly sued, even if the journalist was working with the news organization, he just sued the journalist. The, the name of the news organization was not in the defamation notice. Uh, and those news organizations were not, were not supporting that journalist. So, I mean, I don't know if you have the answer to this question, but what, do, what can such journalists do? And this can happen to any one of us at any point in time, whether we're independent or whether we're in an organization. For the, for the larger good of the Indian economy, I wish he had won all the defamation cases so that the journalist collectively would have you know, bailed out his uh, crumbling empire. He needs, desperately needs money. Uh, you know, I think uh, what you found out is a standard problem. The problem is not just limited to Anil Ambani. See, even a defamation notice is a great way of censoring out the reporting. So if you go back to 12-13, uh, I started bringing out the Delhi electricity audit report, which was being kept secret with the High Court order. Uh, he sent a defamation notice next day and Times of India stopped coverage of the issue. So cases, defamation notice are very effective ways of this thing, uh, of, of censorship, but he, I think, was trying to, and what he has tried to do, which he has not been able to sustain because he has got bigger trouble back home, uh, is to isolate the journalists from the institutions and then bring the institutions under pressure, which is a tactic that they're going to use more and more often. But I would say that be assured, while all this craziness happens, there is something good about India, which is that nobody actually successfully sues anybody and nobody takes home a thousand crores, right? If you believe in the, the lethargy of the system and, and uh, in, the, in the goodness of the Indian anarchy, 
don't worry we will we'll, we'll fight yeah, so if you if you get filed you know call me up i'll tell you what to do no but i also just wanted to add that the new pattern now so this is uh, not just uh, now institutions not supporting journalists has been forever shahina kk she has a case of uh, unlawful activist Preven prevention act against her for the last 10 years the case was filed when she was working with the helka and since then she has had no support she's been supporting herself similarly lots of other journalists this uh, journalist in manipur who was arrested for writing some facebook post criticizing the government and he was charged under national security act and imprisoned for 4 months and uh, similarly rupesh rupesh kumar recently from jharkhand who was arrested so it's also not any any longer defamation but also serious law and order cases criminal cases filed and that leads to them going to jail and spending some time and then supporting themselves so this is a pattern and until and unless uh, journalists come together or press bodies insist on it and at least start talking about it i don't think this is going anywhere no also we have a problem with the uh, supreme court you know we have uh, seen a huge uh, withdrawal of the the liberal values in the supreme court that's one of the reasons why the criminal defamation part of the law remains i mean deepak mishra and gang upheld it it's it's very embarrassing for a democracy to say you know our highest court believes in 21st century that criminal defamation should stay uh, so we have a problem in, at the judicial level also but as i said unless we are actually optimistic we can't do journalism in this country okay, uh, are we done okay thank you david thank you josie and thank you everybody for being here thanks